survive and advance. It's an old cliche, but you can't really describe it better in how Kansas was able to get by Samford. You are Locked On Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. Give me a follow on social media at D Johnson Radio. You can find our show here with Locked On Jayhawks anywhere you get your podcast, including on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. And on today's edition of Locked On Jayhawks, we are recapping Kansas escaping against Samford, surviving and advancing as the old cliche goes, moving on to the second round of the NCAA tournament after things got a little bit wild late into the night on Thursday night. First, this episode of the show is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Kansas wins 93-89. to Honestly, like one of the better games of the tournament. Uh, the Kentucky game was wild. You had the upset factor, too. That was an unbelievable game. This was probably one of the two or three best games. I don't know. Maybe it was the best if you look at just high scoring and everything, but it was certainly up there uh, just from like a a neutral perspective. I think uh, probably a lot of neutral fans or opposing fans not happy with the way it finished and maybe deservedly so with the way things came at the end, but huge exhale for Kansas survive and advance incarnate and, you know, sometimes that's all you need to start off a run. I remember that Auburn team from 2019 that made a Final Four. They barely survived New Mexico State in the first round in like a 5-12 matchup, and they went on. Now, this is a little bit different in the sense of like, I don't know, maybe it's not that different because I think Auburn was up maybe double digits late in that one. Uh, this should have never gotten here. This should have never gotten to the point where Kansas needed to survive late. But then again, sometimes this weird stuff just does happen in March Madness. So maybe you find yourself lucky that you were able to come out on the winning end of something where there was weird stuff going on because a lot of the ways that balls were bouncing or balls falling off the rim and in were not really going your way. Now, before we get into the recap of everything here, we get to our goats of the game and next up for KU. Uh, let's just address the elephant in the room. Let's rip the Band-Aid off right now. The foul that was called against Nick Timberlake at the end of the game, Kansas is up 90 to 89. They break the press. They throw the ball deep to Nick Timberlake. He goes up for the dunk instead of just trying to lay it in or try to run out clock, get fouled, whatever ends up happening. And, uh, you know, honestly, kind of similar to Kansas playing Purdue in, in 2012, right, in the second round, like, you have Tyshawn Taylor and Elijah Johnson kind of hooking up, and uh, you could have had a situation where it was like, well, maybe just, just lay it in or run it out and get fouled or something. You end up going for the shot and, and make it. In this case, you didn't make it. You get blocked from behind, but they call a foul. It was the wrong call. It was not the correct call. It was a clean block. So let's just address that right now. But I don't want to hamper on this. The discourse is going to be so annoying over this over the next, whatever, 48 hours, 24 hours, because a couple things. One, we, we always do this. We hamper on the last call at the end of the game, whatever it ends up being, and we don't hamper on the rest of the calls during the game. Weird stuff happens. Do we really think that uh, number 21 on Sanford took four charges over the course of the game, offensive fouls on just random inbound plays? Were all of those the right call? I don't know. Probably not. Like, there's so many things you can go that maybe didn't get called against Kansas that maybe did get called against Kansas that didn't get called against Sanford that didn't get called against Sanford over the course of the game that – it's unfortunate that it does end like that and it was the wrong call, but I don't want to really hamper more on this. So let's just move on from there. Um, the first 30 minutes of this game was all about excellent execution minus some dumb turnovers by Kansas. There were still dumb turnovers, the 10 second call, throwing the ball out of bounds or like low at somebody who can't catch it. Like those were things that were still happening, but still Kansas was in a position where it was like, okay, they're playing really well. Like they're executing well. They're, um, I think at one point Sanford was like seven of 21 from three, which you gladly were taking, you know, them shooting 33% from, from three, I guess, especially because the way they finished, I think they finished, what would that be? Nine of 16 from three point range. Um, So, I mean, you look at that perspective, like you're executing well there, you're breaking the press when you're not turning it over and it's leading to easy buckets for you. Like there was even a point in the first, I mean, Kansas was like, what, like 11 of 12 or something to start the game. And even then when Kansas was shooting, you know, 70, 80, 90% from the floor, it didn't feel 
fluky. Like it didn't feel like, oh, this is this has to come down from down to earth. Like, yes, it was going to come down to earth a little bit. You weren't going to continue to go 11 of 12 every 12 shots. But it didn't feel fluky because it was like, oh, you're getting layups and dunks. And you're getting wide open threes. Like you're breaking the press. You're executing it well. You're getting open shots. You're pounding the ball inside. You're taking advantage of your size advantage. It didn't feel fluky at all. Like the first 30 minutes were great execution by KU. Uh, I'm sure the week in between and the time off and everything played out well for Kansas. And Samford would hit the occasional three along the way. But, you know, you were up 10, 12, 15, 20 most of the way. Then the final, I don't know what it was, eight minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it was in the game. Maybe the execution dropped a little bit from Kansas. And I think you just tipped the cap to Samford a little bit too. Like they played great over the last stretch of that game. They went bonkers from three. Yes, there were several threes they hit that were wide open. That was poor defense by Kansas. Again, this is kind of the season long thing. Like Kansas gives up too many open threes and they get burned by them. But Kansas also gets burned by contested threes. And that was something that was happening too in this game. And, you know, Samford was making plays. Um, for the game, Samford finished 16 of 37 on three-point shots. That's 43% compared to Kansas going 6 of 18 or 33%. Certainly, if I would have said if I would have said uh, Thursday morning, doing my game preview, you know, talking about Kansas, can they defend the three-point line, all this sort of stuff. If I would have said Samford shot 16 of 37 from three-point range, 43%, while Kansas went 6 of 18, I mean, I would have certainly thought Samford would have won this game. Now, I, I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse moving forward. Just a quick aside here. Like, maybe it makes you feel a little bit better moving forward from one standpoint where it's like, hey, we survived another team going bonkers from three, and we still won the game. Like, that's a good sign. What are the chances that happens again? Then again, we've seen a lot of games this year for Kansas where that has happened for the opposition where it's like, well, if it just happened, what's the chances it happens again next game? Because Gonzaga just went bonkers from three against McNeese State in the first round. So, like, I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse moving forward. But um, Sanford also nearly won, not just because of the three-point shooting, but because of rebounding and turnovers. Like, to a certain standpoint, this game was reminiscent of the West Virginia game, where it was like West Virginia went off shooting the ball, but Kansas could have still won that game in Morgantown earlier this year if they would have rebounded better and made some small plays down the stretch a little bit better. And against Samford, that was kind of a similar thing. Like as much as the three-point shooting was critical for Samford getting back in the game and nearly winning the game, Samford also um, had an 18 to seven turnover advantage, right? They had 11 less turnovers than you did. I mean, you didn't force many and you had way too many dumb ones. And so they were plus 11 there. Um, you look at the total rebounds, and yeah, Kansas had 44 rebounds, Sanford had 35. You're like, oh, Kansas won the rebound battle. Not quite, because when you look at, okay, uh, Kansas is maybe getting up less shots that end with defensive rebounds when you have the 11 more turnovers. You, you know, like all of a sudden, uh, you look at Sanford being up 14 to 8 in offensive rebounds that are giving them extra tries, and a lot of those offensive rebounds are going to lead to, you know, open threes um, afterwards. You consider all that, it, it it's almost like a miracle that Kansas won when you look at those three stats. Sanford went off from three. Kansas had a pedestrian day from three. But that's all one stat with three-point shooting. Kansas was minus 11 in turnovers. And Sanford honestly won the rebounding battle when you look at like rebound rate. You still won the game. I, I don't know how it happened. So how did they win? Well, Kansas won again by breaking the press. Good execution. Dewan Harris and others handling the ball across the press pounding the ball inside, taking advantage of their height. Kansas shot 73% on two-point shots compared to Sanford shooting 39% on two-point shots. All of those other things nearly made up for that fact that Kansas was so dominant on the interior, and a big reason why you get a lot of open dunks and layups once you break the press. That was kind of what the game boiled down to. So bottom line, you know, a four-point win, if, if this game happens in the regular season, we're sitting here going, okay, that's great, Kansas won. But that's not great moving forward that this, this, and that happened, right? And to a certain standpoint, it is. And to a certain standpoint, you know, Bill Self and Kansas are going to use some of the stuff that happened at the end of the game and maybe lack of execution here or there or messing this or that up and be like, hey, we need to correct this going into the next game, right? But we're also in the aftermath here. How much can you really correct at this point in time? You kind of are what you are. So at this point, it becomes a little bit less about, hey, let's – analyze what they did wrong. Can they get better? This is just who they are. Find a way to survive in advance. That's all this is about at this point in time. It's no longer, you know, nitpick this or that. 
it really is once you get to the tournament more just about did you win did you lose is your season alive is your season over and their season is alive and we get to watch another Kansas basketball game and that is a good thing all right let's get to our go to the game good and bad next up a little quick preview on the KU Gonzaga game here on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks first this episode of the show is brought to you by Manscaped the spring cleaning champions. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Clear out the winter bush with Manscaped Lawn Mowers 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code LOCKED ON for $20 off plus free shipping. After using Manscaped, you can say that maybe you'll be catching spring fever. Whether you're looking to craft your signature look for, um, you know, wherever it's the beard, down below, clean up the neckline, there's always the right tools for the job. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. That is 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. This episode of Locked on Jayhawks is also brought to you by Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing out over the tickets. Start getting hyped for the fun that you're going to be having. You can see all the images of the seat views, and this is especially nice. Like Maybe you're out in the NCAA tournament. Maybe you know, you're just buying your tickets on Game Time day-to-day because you didn't want to invest in the first and second round until they made it to the second round. Well, boom, you pull up Game Time time and you pull up the seats and you can see okay i've never been to the stadium before or you know whatever like where are these seats how good of a view is that well you can see that from the game time app and it's super nice because with last minute tickets that are available on game time you can as quickly as being like okay hey we're the second game of the session i'm gonna go on game time at halftime of the first game and hope that there's still tickets available and i'm gonna buy them and i'm gonna get them for discounted because i'm missing kind of the the first game like there's so many things you can do with it it's beautiful snag the tickets without the stress with game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on for 20 dollars off the first purchase terms apply again create an account use code locked on for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed On to our goats of the game. If you're new to the show, new to the segment, we give our new word, uh, or or I guess new adage of the word with goats, which is nowadays the kids greatest of all time. Uh, Back when I was growing up, goat was a bad thing. You're kind of the scapegoat. Let's start with the good goats here. Nick Timberlake, 19 points, five of eight from the field three of six from three point range including that big third one that he hit he started two for two then he missed two on kind of some key ones late and it was like oh no and then he hits the big third one he also was six or seven at the foul line hit those two free throws late after the yes bad call but he still had to make them and he did give credit there three assists two rebounds how about the big deflection he had too i know samford i I think kansas ended up not scoring on the possession and samford went down like can to three right after anyway but like that was up to that point, like a really big play and deflection and and showing some of the hustle there for Timberlake. So uh, he had a really good game. And for a guy who in the off season really harped on the idea, which I think was almost refreshing in a certain way, but was also like a little bit of like, wait, what Uh, to hear in the off season when, you know, there were a lot of questions about, Oh, Nick Timberlake, like, you know, what's some of your goals, stuff like that. And for him, he was just like, I've never been on an NCAA tournament team. Like I want to go to tournament. And from a certain standpoint, like from Kansas, you're sitting there like, what do you mean? This is Kansas. Like we always go to the tournament. Like shouldn't there be other goals than that? But you know, that, that is something that you have to remind yourself of that a lot of other programs aren't as lucky as Kansas in that regard. And and I think for Timberlake, this is an opportunity really to, um, I don't know, kind of turn things around on how the season was, but also he's never been in the tournament before. And so maybe that leads to an extra level of excitement or energy, momentum, whatever it is. Clearly, it showed out in this game, which was uh, cool to see. Dewan Harris gets a good goat. 13 points for Dewan on three of eight shooting. Only one of five from three-point range did hit the early one, but I like the aggressiveness there, shooting the threes. He had seven assists, four rebounds, and I think above all, like you can just throw these stats out the window. Though, I will say Dewan, I believe, has had uh, three straight tournament games of double-digit points, which is nice. Um, just the ability to break the press have a reliable ball handler, a guy who had to play a ton of minutes in this game in altitude against a team constantly pressing him. It was wearing 
for Dewan. It, it was, uh, it, it was, you know, he's playing through foul trouble too. He gets the four fouls. Like that was a heck of a game by Dewan Harris. The, the stats look good again, 13, seven and four, but it, it really is above and beyond that. KJ Adams gets a good go. 20 points for KJ back to back games for that 10 of 13 from the floor. He also had six assists, four rebounds, one block. This is the type of game that favors KJ. If you can play a transition game where he can, you know, be the guy cutting in transition and with a head of steam, this strong, fast, athletic dude is running through and ready to throw down alley oops and get layups in transition. Like that benefits him. Being somebody who can pass and dribble in the open court, he gets six assists. Like that benefits him. So I thought KJ was really good for KU. Obviously, you want to clean up the free throw shooting. Uh, again, you want to see, you know, at least six probably rebounds from KJ every game, but that's kind of nitpicking a little bit more. He was really good. And the energy he provided, as always, was great. Um, being the first one on the floor for the one loose ball toward the end of the game. I know they ended up getting the ball on the jump ball and then they came to three right after, but like he was the first one on the floor there. Uh overall, I think I think for both teams, certainly for Kansas. And that was after he like threw down the dunk and then was kind of holding his back, which by the way, I guess you got to hope now that his back's okay coming into the next game. Hunter Dickinson gets a good go. Certainly um, you saw again, the limitations of kind of playing two bigs and playing a slower footed big with Hunter Dickinson on defense and how um, H or eight uh, or, you know, they, they were able to hit a lot of threes and kind of take advantage of that a little bit with stretch five, but overall Hunter still had a huge positive impact in this game. 19 points, nine of 14 shooting, 20 rebounds, five assists. He was also really good in interior defense with four blocks, two steals. They shot below 40% on two point shots. Uh, you saw the huge plus minus from when he was off the court to when he was on the court, big drop off between him and, and what Parker Brown, Parker Brown's on a serviceable, serviceable job this year for what he's been asked to do for Kansas. But at this point in time, it is such a huge drop off that that's why I kind of go back to a couple of weeks ago. I kind of think KJ should just play the backup five minutes and, Maybe you work around here, but then again, you don't have Kevin McCuller, so less guys to be able to do that with. So I understand why it happens. But uh, overall, Hunter was really good for you in this game. Uh, the passing, 25 assists for Kansas. Outside of the turnovers, the passing was really good. Unfortunately, the turnovers are part of it, part of the story here for KU. But uh, the passing to score, I guess you would say, was was really intentional and good for Kansas in a lot of ways, outside of a few, which let's get to our bad goats here. Let's talk about boneheaded freshman plays. Now, they're boneheaded plays throughout the game from every team and every level of player. And honestly, like Johnny Furphy, overall, great production, 16 points, eight rebounds, three assists. El Marco Jackson, great production overall, six points, uh, three rebounds, one steal, hit some tough mid-range shots, yada, yada, yada. And so I'm not putting either Furphy or El Marco in the bad goats. I'm just putting a couple of the boneheaded freshman plays that happened in there specifically. Um, like from the Furphy one, not getting on the ground as quick on the loose ball toward the end of the game. I don't know if it mattered or not. Might have just been a jump ball anyway, especially with how quickly KJ got there. Yeah, the bad pass to KJ that led to the turnover, uh, nearly fouling. Furphy was shooting the free throws. He hit the first to go up four, missed the second. He went for the rebound and nearly fouled the guy on a full court shot, which who knows? Maybe he makes the shot and he gets fouled. Like, could you imagine that gaff if that would have happened? Just you're better off just just let him shoot it. Just don't go for the rebound. Let him shoot it. You're up four. It's whatever, right? And so overall, again, Furphy, good production, great start to the game. Um, far from a bad game for Furphy, but again, a couple boneheaded moments here or there. Same with El Marco. Like you got good enough production off the bench, and he comes up with a huge play at the end of the game, which should be commended for throwing it off the guy out of bounds to give Kansas the ball with like three seconds left. But also a lot of really bad passes, a lot of head scratching turnovers. So again, I, I'm not putting El Marco and Furphy in the bad goats. I'm just putting there were a few flashes, a few instances from both guys that you hope can get cleaned up coming into your next game against Gonzaga. The three point defense, bad goat. That's pretty obvious there for Kansas, though. Tip of the cap to them because they made a lot of tough shots in addition to a lot of the wide open ones that you had. Though uh, you know having a stretch five certainly uh, not great for. Kansas, in terms of the matchups they have to play against, which um, I think that'll be a little bit better in your next matchup with Gonzaga. We'll we'll get to that here, uh, coming up here in a second. Um, and then free throw shooting, not great for Kansas, 17 of 27, 63%. I mean, that could have cost you the game, right? A few points here or there. That could have been the difference. Rebounding, as we talked about, not great for Kansas. Even though they won the total rebound, rebound rate was not great for Kansas. And that allowed Sanford to get a bunch of extra shots up and a bunch of extra threes. And then last one here is Rylan Jones. Listen, man, I, uh, I am just glad I'm done having to watch the guy. Let's say that good basketball player, but like, I just, I can't, I can't. 
It is, it is so uninteresting and so not entertaining to watch somebody who literally flops at every instance and every moment and every inbound play is trying to take a flop. It is exhausting. It is brutal. And I'm I'm sure he's a great dude. I'm sure, I don't know, might be, might be not, whatever. I'm sure he's a great dude. Um, had a great year for Sanford. Sanford's a great team. I'm just glad I don't have to watch him play basketball anymore. All right, let's get on to uh, what's next with the Gonzaga game on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by your friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The Oregon Ducks are this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in the final Pac-12 tournament, punching their ticket to the big dance. They always say, win life go rogue, and that's exactly what the Ducks have done, then earning a first-round victory, dominating South Carolina, and Folly Dante, absolute beast. You can take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, finishing things up, Kansas now will play Gonzaga in a region where, you know, the 12 and 13, McNeese and Sanford are really good teams. McNeese did not show it at all today, and Gonzaga played a really good game. Um, you had both the four and the five advance, and I feel like that happens a lot in the tournament. Like everybody picks one 12 and 13 seed, and then it's usually one that you're not really paying as much attention to that ends up coming through. So anyway, you're going to be playing Gonzaga now, and this becomes an interesting matchup. Gonzaga is a top 10 offense in the country. Defense is in the 40s, so maybe something to give there. They're another high-tempo team. You have to deal with, hey, you had to play 40 tight minutes with how you had to play that one at the end. In altitude, can you rest and recover? Gonzaga had the earlier game, too, so you have to deal with that. You heard the 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 crowd. That sounded like a road game for Kansas. I think it was a little bit less about what Samford traveled to the game. I think it was a little bit more about the closest fan base, which was Gonzaga. A lot of their fans were rooting against you. And so that was basically like a road environment, but that tells you that when you're playing Gonzaga, it's probably going to be even worse. Kansas always travels so well and will bring a nice contingent, but this is going to basically be a road game, I would imagine, for Kansas. Um, When you look at some of the things Gonzaga does well, they shot electric from three against McNeese State, and they've shot really efficiently from three this year, but they're actually in the 300s in the amount of threes they're taking. So if you do moderately well at def- at just preventing those shots from getting up. You should be okay, but they're top 10 in two-point percentage. They don't turn the ball over. They rebound the ball well. They defend the interior well on defense, really good two-point defense. It's going to be an interesting matchup. They do play two bigs. Ben Gregg at 6'10", 230, plays most of the minutes at the four. Graham E.K., a little bit of Braden Huff at the five. So they're playing two bigs in there. Occasionally, they'll, they'll slide Anton Watson down to the four for a decent amount of minutes per game, and then they'll play uh, with really just one big from that point in time. But when they are playing with two bigs, with Graham E.K. kind of down there at the five, E.K. has only taken 13 threes this year. He's three of 13 last uh, season that he played uh, 2022 at Wyoming. He's one of nine. So in some ways, Gonzaga's a great, like a really good team. I mean, you look at it and on Ken Palm, they're 12th in the country. This is going to be a harder matchup than anybody Kansas could have played in this in this pod in terms of how good the opponent is. But in terms of the style of matchup, with it being more big on big basketball and not having to worry about a stretch five, that is something that they don't have to worry about, which is nice. But Gonzaga is going to be favored in this game which means that you're going to be expected to lose. So uh, let's see what Bill Self can do as an underdog in the NCAA tournament without the full week off in between. We'll have a full preview of the game coming up later this week on Locked on Jayhawks. You can find our show anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page. See you next time. Enjoy. Get some sleep. And Kansas survives in advances.